All right, I'm assuming that we are going. We are in, actually, I don't know what week. Uh, I guess week seven or eight of our 13 weeks of the life and ministry of Christ. And we're still at the birth. <laughs> I apologize for that in one sense that we haven't moved any further than the birth of Christ in our eight or seven or eight weeks. Uh, one week, uh, or I guess two weeks, uh, was I, I was not here, and that's what I wanted you to read that material for. Uh, you got any questions or observations about that material? Okay. Yeah, it's, it was it was thick, and uh, probably 200 pages was a bit much. I, I, we had a meeting of the faculty. Uh, Right before I left, and I told them what I had done you know, because I'm not going to be able to be here and don't have a substitute. And I told them what I had done it, give you all the 200 pages. They all looked at me 200 pages. I said, It's two weeks. <laughs> yeah, you're an avid reader. Well, good for you. Well, it's not a novel, so it's not going to read like a novel, but uh, it. He, I think he does a really good job uh, with it, uh, and I hope that you will read the book uh, thoroughly, and you'll you'll gain lots of information uh, from it. But I, you know, I, in one sense, I apologize that we haven't gotten any further than we have. But in another sense, I don't apologize. I, I like to for us to, if we don't cover everything, I like for us to understand what we do cover, and I want us to have it thoroughly uh, in our minds, that, and that we. Well, what I want you to do is, you know, when we when we get done with the birth of Christ, you will know the birth of Christ, the surrounding circumstances of the birth of Christ. Not only what's in the scripture text, but what happened in history. We've talked about Herod, and that, uh, he existed during that time. We'll talk about some more things. We're still going to be in the birth of Christ tonight. Hopefully we'll get through it uh, tonight and we can move on to something else uh, next week. But I, I do uh, think there's a lot of a lot of things here that we just take for granted. Uh, about the birth of Christ, and I want us to be you know, as thoroughly informed as we can, and especially for those who are preaching, who are going to have to share this message with, with others. They need to know what they're talking about. They, they need to know all the uh, if, ands, and buts and circumstances so that they can better be better prepared to uh, talk to others about it. All right, well, let's, let's get into it then. We've met um, the family of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. He is uh, son of God, he's son of Abraham, he's son of David, and he is um, the savior of the world, as we have learned, the one who is sent to be uh, God with us, or sa the savior. He has a legal lineage. He is adopted by Joseph, and if you go back in that lineage that Matthew gives us, you're going to find a lot of rough characters, some really good characters, but you're going to find some pretty rough characters. There's Tricky Jacob, there's two-timing uh, Judah, there were murderers, there were adulterers, uh, there were prostitutes, uh, men who sacrificed their children in the flames of uh, paganism's fires. Uh, the sinfulness of his ancestry uh, demonstrates the, the need that they had of a savior. God is sending to us a Savior, and their very lives indicate that they needed that Savior. And our sins are, are no different. Maybe we're not like uh, Jacob was. Maybe we're not like Judah was. Maybe we're not murderers or adulterers or sacrificing our kids in paganism's fires. But we're sinners, nonetheless, falling short of the glory of God and need the Savior that God has, has sent. His, though his lineage was checkered with sinful men, that lineage, as it comes from David, nevertheless qualifies him to be king of kings and lord of lords. He has other qualifications to meet, and Matthew will, throughout his book, uh, he intends to prove to us what uh, that Jesus did meet those criteria, all the criteria that God had set forth as to 
the one who's going to be king, he must do all these things. He must fulfill all these things. Matthew's going to show us that Jesus of Nazareth did just that. Incidentally, um, when do you, in your mind, when does Jesus assume this role of king of kings and lord of lords? When is he given that position or does he assume that position? Okay. Let's look at the scriptures because I want us to see the answer to that question. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 29, beginning. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. This is Peter's famous sermon on the day of Pentecost, just a portion of it. He says, men and brethren, after he has discussed some things, he says, let me speak to you freely or freely to you of the patriarch David that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. They couldn't argue about that. There would be no reason to argue. They all knew that the uh, shrine of David was there in Jerusalem. Peter's probably pointing at it at that time. Therefore, being a prophet, David being a prophet, and David knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he, God, would raise up Christ to set up on his throne. I said it's God's throne, I believe. Or maybe David's throne. Anyway, verse 31, David, foreseeing this prophetically, he spoke concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or resurrection of Christ, that his, Christ's soul, was not left in Hades, nor did Christ's flesh see corruption. This Jesus, Peter says, God has raised up of which we, the apostles, we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. So according to Peter, it was after God raised up Jesus, verse 32, of which we are witnesses, the apostles, that God exalted him to the right hand of God. The right hand being the throne of God, the ruling place of God. Let's look further to see this and confirm this. Look over in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite passages. I have lots of them. And about 66 books. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 8. Uh, the first part of this passage is a wonderful uh, teaching about the humility of Jesus Christ, the humbleness of Jesus Christ, what he gave up in order to become what he did. And in verse 8 it says, Being found in appearance, Jesus being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to death of the cross, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because he had humbled himself, even to death, even the death of the cross, therefore, because of that, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So when did Jesus assume, or when was Jesus given this place, this exalted place, this highly exalted place above every name. Well, it's at the resurrection. When Jesus was resurrected from the grave. After he was, actually he doesn't mention the resurrection here. We know that it happened. Peter mentioned it in Acts chapter 2. Paul mentions the death. But after the death, there came the resurrection. Because he submitted himself to the extent of death on that cross, and all that that means, God highly exalted him. I look at one other passage in Ephesians chapter 1. One book back, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. Paul, uh, Especially in class, I don't want my phone going off. 
All right, going back to Ephesians 1 and verse 15. Therefore, Paul says, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and of your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in all my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, I pray this, that he may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of, of Jesus. That the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of the, of the inheritance of the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of right, his mighty power, which he, that he is God, which God worked in Christ Jesus. What has he worked? The mighty power that God worked in Christ Jesus when he raised Jesus from the dead and then did what? Seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above principality, power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet, gave him to be head of all things to the church, which is about the fullness of him that goes all in all. So, according to Paul in these two letters, and also Peter, there in Acts chapter 2, Jesus is made king at the resurrection. Or maybe even at the ascension. After the when Jesus ascended back to God, he placed him on the right hand of God. Daniel foresaw that. If we were in a study of the Daniel a book of Daniel, I could show you where uh, Daniel saw that Jesus would go to the Father and be put on the right hand, or where the Messiah would go to the Father and be put on the right hand of the Father. That's what's happening here. Jesus was made king. Now, he's referred to as Lord and referred to as king in the New Testament. He, he didn't actually assume that position or was, given, was not given that position by God until after he had proven himself, after he had given himself on the cross for the salvation of humanity, after he was resurrected from the dead and then ascended to the, hand, the right hand of the Father. Uh, but he met all the qualifications, and I think his, his death is one of those qualifications that he had to meet in order to become the king of God's kingdom. Uh, he had to meet those qualifications uh, to, for God to exalt him in that way. So in our discussion of the birth of Christ, we have seen the, the, the lineage of Jesus uh, and how that proves him to be or qualifies him to be the one who would take the throne uh, of God. In our discussion, we've also seen where Matthew recorded how the uh, angel came to the mother and uh, to the legal father, Joseph, to announce to them what child this is. What child is this? Who is this child that you're going to, to give birth to? And Matthew asserts in that uh, study, uh, in that uh, teaching, he asserts and defends the virgin birth, and we talked about this in our last uh, class, the virgin birth without apology. You know, you, you talk to your, your your girls today, and or your girl daughter comes to you and says, I'm pregnant, but I haven't been with a man. You're going to say, well, no. <laughs> but Matthew speaks the virgin birth without apology. He says, it's a fact. It was prophesied 800 years ago, and here it is. Uh, it, it's happened just as God had uh promise. So while the skeptics uh, see something here that's unbelievable, while those who don't know anything about God or care anything about God may mock us for our belief, oh yeah, you believe that Mary was a virgin and had a baby? <laughs> um, while they may mock us, this is the foundation of our faith. If Jesus was not born of a virgin, then the beginning parts of the gospel that are revealed to us are inaccurate, uh, it's just a fairy tale, but it's not a fairy tale. This uh, this Christmas season, I hope that when you see those nativity scenes, or if you have one of those nativity scenes, that you will see something more than a plastic baby in a plastic manger with plastic animals. It's not a fairy tale. It's the very work of God in this world, a God who loves you, a God who brought his son into this world to to live and to die so that we can live with him eternally. He is the Christ. He is God who became man. He is man who was God. Uh, whether the rest of humanity believes it or not, this is where we put our faith. What I want to do tonight is look at a particular passage, and I know I'm guilty of staying in one place too long. I should move on so we can cover more territory, but I want to see actually a passage of scripture in Matthew that's referred to or used many times throughout Matthew. We're still in Matthew chapter 1. I'll give you a chance to get back to that. 
there, verse 22. Listen to what he says. So all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. All of this concerning the, the birth of Christ, this was done so that it would be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, the virgin birth particularly. Matthew is going to use this phrase that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet. He's going to use that phrase or a variant of it throughout his book. And I think it's like 14 times, maybe more than that. I, I didn't put it in my nose. But I think it's 14 times that he uses that phrase in the first four chapters he's going to use it six times he's referring to prophecy saying that jesus fulfilled prophecy this is one of the characteristics that jesus has to fulfill in order to be the king to be the the one that god has anointed the one that god is sending in order to be that person he has to fulfill the prophecies and so one of the things matthew is going to do is over and over again said this is one of those things that the prophet said he's going to do and look he did it and I want to go through some of those with you uh, in this uh, hour uh, to, to realize, as Matthew wanted his Jewish readers to realize, this is that king that was promised. I want you to know, not just because the preacher said it, but I want you to know because all history confirms it prior to Christ and at the time of Christ that Jesus is the one that God has been promising. Look over, for example, in chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, in verse 13, it says, Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, Stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, that is when Joseph arose, he took the young child, his mother, by night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, what? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. Now, if I have time in a later lesson, I want to deal in that, that prophecy more in depth, but I'll just kind of briefly look at it uh, in this hour. Matthew takes a passage from Hosea, the book of Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1, that originally spoke of Israel. The, the, the people of Israel was the son that God called out of Egypt, and he's speaking in reference to their coming out of the Egyptian slavery after being there for 400 years and then coming out of the wilderness and then into the land of Canaan. And God said through Hosea, re refreshing Israel's mind uh, during the time of Hosea, which is about uh, 800 years or so past uh, the Egyptian bondage. You got the Egyptian bondage and about 800 years later, I forget the exact date of Hosea, but let's just say 800,000 years uh, past the the exodus he's saying i want you to look back at that exodus time and he says uh he, he uses that term god has called you his son out of egypt uh, jacob's family uh, wa went to egypt looking for food you remember the story uh, god had prepared the way for jacob's family coming to egypt by sending joseph into Egypt by way of the, son, the other brothers selling Joseph to the Midianites. The Midianites sold them to you know, to the Egyptians. He was in uh, Potiphar's house for a while, was arrested because he was accused of rape for, of uh, Potiphar's wife, went to prison, met the ba uh, baker and the butler there, he interpreted their dreams. Later on, he interpreted Pharaoh's dream and it was elevated then to the second most highest place in the world, in Egypt, but in the world at, at that time. So. Uh, he went there as a slave, ended up as the most power, second most powerful man there, and through that means, God prepared a way for Israel, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, the family of Jacob, to come to Egypt for the next uh, 400 uh, years. When they came there, they came as guests, but during the time that they were there, there was a change in Egyptian uh, dynasty or regime, and they ended up being slaves. So they came as guests, but ended up being uh, slaves and fulfilling his promise, God's promise to Abraham, God sent eventually a man named Moses, rescued Moses from the uh, 
Nile River uh, through Pharaoh's uh, daughter. Uh, he was raised there in Pharaoh's household. And then 80 years later, God used Moses, that same Moses, to deliver his people from that slavery in Egypt. Ironically, this quotation from Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, shows us that God also rescued Jesus from a king that was trying to kill him. Moses, uh, the king tried to kill Moses because Moses had killed the Egyptian. That, uh, and Pharaoh says, you can't kill an Egyptian, so I'm going to kill you. So Moses went and hid for 40 years in the wilderness. Uh, God saved him from uh, that destruction and then later on saved uh, Israel from Egypt, and also God saves uh, Jesus from a king who was trying to kill him. He wasn't an Egyptian king, he was Herod, he was an Idumean, we talked about that, uh, but anyway, he rescued Jesus from uh, the grasp of this man, sent Jesus to Egypt, and then called Jesus out of Egypt. So it's kind of a dual prophecy. Actually, when Hosea spoke of it, he wasn't speaking prophetically. He was speaking of the past that God called Israel out of Egypt, my son out of Egypt. But uh, Matthew says that by inspiration, this also applies to Jesus and that he would be called out of uh, Egypt. All right, before he moves on, Matthew chapter 2, uh, verse 16, we find another blast from the past. Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all the districts for two years, from two years old and under, according to the time which uh, he had determined from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet, Jeremiah in this case, the prophet saying, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because there was, uh, because they are no more. Again, not so much a prophecy as it is a remembrance or an application of an old story uh, to a new one. This quote comes from Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 15. Jeremiah speaking poetically of Rachel. Rachel was the uh, mother of Joseph and Benjamin. She was the favorite wife of, of Jacob. And uh, it, it pictures her as weeping from the grave because her children that lived in the time of Jeremiah were either being killed or taken into exile. And so Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, speaks prophetically and well, not prophetically, but uh, poetically, I guess, of Rachel. Uh, if she were alive today, she would be crying. She would be weeping. Um, it's like we use the term that um, somebody would roll over in his grave if he knew what was happening today. Well, that's what he's saying. Uh, Rachel would be weeping in her grave if she could see what's taking, what's happening to her children, the children of Israel at this time. The passage goes on to tell the, the people, Jeremiah telling the people that there's coming a time when you're, there's no longer room for weeping because, yes, they're going into captivity now. Some of them are being killed but and they're going into captivity, but God's making a promise to you that they will come back. So while it's a time of weeping now, there will be a time of joy. You will come back. Seventy years, but still you will come back from the land of the enemy. Well, Matthew here appropriates these words of Rachel weeping over her uh, children, saying that she's now again weeping over her, the death of these innocents that Herod uh, is killing. He's, she's again using our terminology, uh, rolling over in her grave, in Jeremiah's terminology, weeping from the grave over the loss of uh, these children. Uh, and one day, I think in the same sense that Jeremiah spoke of initially, one day the voice of weeping will be turned to joy because this king, this baby who did escape, will become king, king of kings, lord of lords, and he will save all of us, and his vengeance will be taken out upon this Herod and those like him who seek to destroy him. In the next passage, Matthew again appeals to the prophet prophets for verification of who this baby really is. Verse 19, chapter 2, verse 19. Listen to it. When Herod was dead, this is the Herod who was trying to kill Jesus, the one who killed the babies. Uh, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream 
to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. Then he, Joseph, arose, took the child and mother, and came to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside to the region of Galilee. So he was probably headed back to Bethlehem, the hometown of David, which would be the, the uh, town of his uh, descendants, or uh, I guess ancestors. He was headed back that direction anyway, but God said, don't go there. Uh, go to uh, Galilee. God warned him in a dream, and then he turned aside to the, to the region of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, and here's the what we're looking at that we're looking for that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet he shall be called a Nazareth. Now that one presents a, a bit of a problem because we can't turn to any prophetic passage that says the king or Jesus the Messiah the anointed one will be born in or not born but live in Nazareth or be called a Nazarene. There's no statement on record that says that. Now, Matthew says uh, that it might be full, full, fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. Apparently, more than one prophet did say this, but, uh, well, there's a couple options we have, I guess, to understand this, uh, or maybe more than a couple, but at least two that I'll, I'll give you. One is that the prophets did say it, but they didn't write it down. There was more than one prophet uh, who prophesied who didn't write anything down. For example, Elijah. We don't have a, a book of Elijah. Like we have a book of Isaiah or Jeremiah. We don't have a book of Elijah. He didn't write anything down. We have some of his speeches or statements to the kings that, under whom he served uh, written for us, uh, but we don't have anything written by Elijah. The same thing with uh, Elisha. Uh, the same thing with um well, several several prophets that there's uh, Nathan, there's uh, well, I'm drawing a blank right now, but there's several prophets that spoke that didn't actually write, and it could be that in their statements, at some point in their statements, they indicated that the anointed one would be called a Nazarene. So that's one option we have to explain this passage. Another one uh, is that. Um, Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a rod being a, a, a branch, uh, a, a shoot, from the stem, the root of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Jews, the Hebrews, when they spoke um, poetically, like in the book of Psalms, they would oftentimes repeat themselves. They'd say the same statement twice, but in different words. That's what he does here. A uh, rod from the stem of Jesse is the same thing as a branch from the, that grows out of its roots. It's two ways of saying the same thing. It's, it's in poetic language. You and I can't see it so much because when we think of poetry as uh, what uh, a poem that rhymes, uh, what roses are red, violets are blue, and Something, 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 and I love you, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> That's how we think of it. My simplistic mind, I don't do good with poetry, do well with poetry. Uh, that's how I think of uh, as poetry. So uh, Jewish poetry is, it has its own style, has its own way. And one of the styles uh, of Jewish poetry, one of the things that's very noticeable about Jewish poetry is that it repeats itself often. You'll find it in the Psalms. You'll find in the Proverbs. You'll, you'll see a statement made, and you'll see it's made again just in different words. So here's the statement. A rod shall come forth from the stem of Jesse. A branch shall go forth from his roots. Uh, both phrases say the same thing. The word branch, the Hebrew word that's translated branch, is also a the word that from which the Jews got the word Nazareth. Jesus was called a what? Well, the prophet said, Matthew said that Jesus would be called a Nazarene because it came from uh, Nazareth. And the word branch comes from the word, or is the Hebrew word netzar. And it's a form of the word netzar that uh, was used to form the name of the town called 
Nazareth. So from that sense, when Isaiah says that shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch, a netzar, shall grow forth from his roots, he's talking about Jesus, and he's talking about how Jesus would be called a netzar, a, a branch, and he is, not only here in Isaiah, but in, in, in other places. So it's kind of a double reference. He's both from uh, Nazareth and thus called a Nazarene. He's also a descendant of Jesse, and therefore he is a netzar, a, a branch from uh, Jesse, who is David's father, uh, and therefore he would be called, he could be called, or the prophet said would be called a Nazarene. What's the difference? You probably heard the term a Nazarite and a Nazarene. What's the difference between those two terms? In the Hebrew, they're not even remotely close, but in English, it's, they sound close. Nazarene is someone from Nazareth. Uh, like uh, I'm a Floridian or I'm a Tennessean. Well, he was a Nazarenean, <laughs> I guess if we put it in English. A Nazarite is a particular uh, Jewish person who has taken a particular kind of vow. There was a vow called the Nazarite vow. It had nothing to do with Nazareth. But in English, it looks the same or sounds the same, but it's, a, it's what Samson. Samson took the Nazarite vow. He couldn't cut his hair. He couldn't touch a dead body. He couldn't take anything from the, the, the grapevine, uh, grape juice, raisins, whatever. He couldn't, as long as he was under that vow, he couldn't do any of those, uh, those things. He violated his vow, but nevertheless, uh, he was under the Nazarite vow. So Nazarite, Nazarene, not important to the text here, They're just because it comes up, I wanted you to see the difference. He, Jesus is not a Nazarite. He is a Nazarene. The prophet said he would be called a Nazarene. And while we can't find a specific passage from the prophets that says that, there's two explanations. One, there are a lot of prophets that didn't write anything down that could have said that the coming one would be called a Nazarene. And also we have this passage in Isaiah chapter 11 that says he would be a Netzar, which is the same or at least a portion of the same word from which we get Nazareth, and therefore we get the idea that he was a Nazarene. But the point I wanted to get is Isaiah, or not Isaiah, Matthew once again is saying, that he, he's saying that Jesus is fulfilling what the prophets have said. And he does that over and over and again throughout his text. Look over in chapter 3. Chapter 3. Uh, in those days, um, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness and saying what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths uh, straight. So Matthew uses the prophetic finger to point to Jesus by showing us that John is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy that someone is going to come and prepare the way for this person. Well, John is the one who's doing that, and Jesus is the one for whom he is preparing uh, the way. Matthew chapter 4. This is one of my favorites, I think, of these prophetic voices. When G Verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, that's John the baptizer, had been put in prison, Jesus departed to Galilee, and <clears throat> leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum. Capernaum becomes really the... the uh, central point of Jesus' ministry from this point on. He came and he dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea uh, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. If you know your Jewish history, you know that Zebulun and Naphtali are two of the 12 tribes uh, from uh, Jacob. So in the regions that were appointed to uh, Zebulun and Naphtali is where this area is, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun, this is a wonderful, uh, I wish I had time to preach a lesson right here, but I don't. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, uh, uh, light has dawned. So as Matthew said, this it's a quote from Isaiah, the people of the uh, tribal area of Zebulun and, and Naphtali, years before, during the time of Isaiah, actually prior to Isaiah, were among the first who went into Assyrian captivity. If you look at your map, 
you'll find where Assyria is, or Assyria is, uh, and when they uh, came to uh, Canaan, to Israel, to begin the destruction that they did, the first place they come to is the northern parts, because they came from the north to the south, and Naphtali and Zebulun were the areas that they would come to, so the first place they would come to is here. These were the first ones to go into captivity, and from the time of Joshua, going back to the time of Joshua, that same area was highly populated with Gentiles. Shouldn't have been, but it was. It's called, as I, uh, Matthew pointed out and Isaiah said, it's called Galilee of the Gentiles. A constant reminder of the fact that the Jews of Joshua's day did not accomplish because of rebellion, because of faithlessness, Whatever the reason was, they did not accomplish what God gave them to do. He says, go in and rid the land of the Canaanite, the Hivite, the Girgashite, the, the Termite. No, not the Termite, but uh, <laughs> get rid of, the, do away with those tribal uh, nations, but they did not. Rather, they left them, they enslaved them or married them or were later enslaved by them. And nevertheless, Gentiles the nations were left in the land when they weren't supposed to be. And so Isaiah says that because of that, it's called Galilee of the uh, Gentiles. Spiritually speaking, then, it was a dark place, a place of uh, ignorance, a place of idolatry, a place of blindness of heart. And Isaiah is saying into that darkness, into that spiritual darkness will come a light. And for you and I, it's you know, the, the star of Bethlehem. It's the root and offspring of David. It says, Revelation says, it's the bright and morning star. It's Jesus has come into this place of darkness as a light. Well, we can say that about the world in general. Isaiah is speaking specifically of this area because this is the area that Jesus uh, actually lived in. So in this place of spiritual death came the one uh, in whom there is life. And the light of men, John says in John chapter 1, verse 4. Some think that Jesus came to Nazareth or to Galilee specifically uh, to hide from Herod because uh, Herod had, had imprisoned John. But really, the, the, this, this area that Jesus came to was still under the domain of that uh, Herod. So I don't know that that's, we could say that that's why he went to this area. Jesus came here to Galilee of the Gentiles because it was his mission, his prophetic mission to do so, as was stated by Isaiah 800 years before. In order for him to be the person that going, God is going to use, he has to fulfill all of these prophecies. So even if there were no other reason for him to go to Galilee of the Gentiles, that's reason enough. I'll go there because it's God's will. That's what God said he must be done. That's what I'll do. I don't think it worked out like that. I think it, you know, there were circumstances that caused him to be there, but whatever the circumstances were, whether it was just him saying, I'm going to obey God's will, we're going to make this according to prophecy, or if there were circumstances that provided it, he still came from this area, he fulfilled the prophecy. This is the light that has come and brought light. Again, I wish I had time to make this into a, a, a sermon that should come from this, but I do that too much, and that's why we're only in chapter uh, 2 of Matthew when we should be way beyond that. Uh, it's out of darkness of sin that we've been called and from which we have been uh, saved by the grace of God because God sent this light in the darkness. Matthew doesn't want us to miss the fact that God has been working on this event from times eternal. From the time of Isaiah, from the dawn of creation, God knew that Jesus was going to be a light in the area of the Galilee of the Gentiles, and that light would be seen. Uh, even though it was a dark area, and had been a dark area for a long time because of Jewish rebellion, uh, God would send that light, I guess you might say, to the most or least likely of spots. Why not to Rome where things were uh, happening? Or why not to, to Jerusalem? He sent him to Galilee of the Gentiles. Again, we could talk about that for a long time. But we won't. Matthew chapter 8. That's where we find the next uh, prophecy. When evening had come, Matthew chapter 8, verse 16. 
When evening had come, the people of Capernaum brought to Jesus many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out spirits, the spirits with the word, and healed uh, all who were sick. Why? Well, there's a lot of reasons that we could put here. But one of the reasons is, verse 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, that he took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Jesus is God incarnate. He has the characteristics of both man and God. Here we find that it was prophesied that he would have the healing power of God. And Isaiah is telling the Jews here, what you see, or when you see this man who has this healing power of God, you will know what? He's the one. He's the Messiah. He's fulfilled these other prophecies. He's not talking about the other prophecies right now, but he's saying this is one in that list that he must be able to have, or he must have the healing power of God. So when you see someone that comes by, uh, that, um, hey, Vincent. Hello. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> uh, when you see someone that, that, comes and has that healing power of God, you know that's the one. And that's what Matthew is is doing uh, here. Uh, they they saw it. The Jews did. They saw that healing power. They brought their their masses to him to to be healed. The uh, Jesus demonstrated his healing power throughout Galilee and even in other areas of Judah, uh, around Jerusalem and so forth. He healed blind men uh, there. Uh, and lepers uh, there. So wherever Jesus was, he demonstrated that healing power. So the Jews saw it by the hundreds, by the thousands, by the tens. They all saw it, and they had been anticipating that through their words of their prophets for, for centuries. But when he came, they, and to me it's a sad passage, what they obviously saw, they rejected. Uh, Jesus would later on say about this very town in which he was, Capernaum, he would later say that Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they're going to have a better reception on the day of judgment than you because if they saw what you saw, they would have repented. But you, you won't. All right, moving on because I could, I, could, I could camp out there for a while. Need to move on. Matthew chapter 12. Vincent, can you hear me? I can't hear you. I cannot hear you. I don't know if it's my earpiece or, or what, but I can't hear you. I apologize. Over in Matthew tra chapter 12, uh, it's again, Isaiah to whom Matthew points, verse 14, uh, and this is one of those, my favorite passages again. Uh, <laughs> then the Pharisees went out and plotted against Jesus how they might destroy him, but when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet he warned them, those whom he was healing, do not make me known. Why? The Pharisees are trying to kill me, and you know, I, I want to do these things for you, but if you go out and tell folks what I'm doing, the Pharisees are going to come here. They're going to try to kill me. Not that he was afraid of that, but he didn't want it to happen before it was time. At any rate, uh, he, he warned the multitudes. Uh, not to make him known, they did it anyway, uh, that it might be fulfilled, verse 17, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Uh, Vincent, I don't know if you can hear me, but we're going through the book of Matthew, looking at the, the various times where Matthew <clears throat> points to prophecy and says Jesus fulfilled that prophecy. So that's what we're okay. doing. You've missed the first few of those, but you can get it on the video later, that is, if you can hear me. Verse 17. Yes. Matthew chapter 12, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. You see that poetry again therein. He's repeating himself, making the same statement twice in different ways. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my, my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. If you had the power, to heal, uh, cast out demons, and do all the things that Jesus was doing there. If someone had that power today, what would they be doing? Look at me, what I can do, and bring me the money. <laughs> That's what they'd be doing. Matthew or Isaiah says, 
prophetically of Jesus that when he comes, yes, he'll have that healing power. We saw that in the last prophecy, but he's going to be a person who's not going to cry out, nor, nor will his voice be, anyone hear his voice in the streets. It's not to say that Jesus didn't preach in the streets. He did, but he's not going out there saying, look at me, what I can do and what I can do for you. Bring me the money because that's what the Pharisees would be doing. And that's what they're doing today. Uh, but Jesus didn't come here to be a rock star. That's not what he was looking for. That's not what he's about. He's not out there in the streets saying, look at me. He's, he's showing people the glory of God. He's, he's the one who's showing or has the healing power of God. He understands this is a blessing that comes from God to be given to the people to, so that people can understand the one you promised has come. So it's all about God. It's not about Jesus and what he can do. It's not about him walking on water because he can walk. Look what I can do. It's He's proving to them, I am the one from God. You need to hear me because this is your last chance. Well, Jesus is trying to show people the glory and the kingdom of God. He has the very spirit of God upon him to do that. The passage goes on to show that Messiah, the servant of God, will be a, a, a man of great compassion man of tender care and Matthew says that Jesus withdrew from public because he he needed more time to before his sacrifice that he knew he was going to offer to continue to declare the kingdom of God it's a wonderful prophecy and we could talk a long time here about all of this but we have to move on you sure can Oh, you don't want to ask me that question because that's a sermon that I love to preach. <laughs> a bruised reed he will not bend or break, and a smoking flax he will not quench. You should not have asked me that question. <laughs> a bruised reed. What is a reed? Well, um, John, uh, they, if you go down to the Jordan River, or if you go down to the local pond, local lake, you'll find reeds. Uh, cat, we used to call them cattails, uh, and there's different kinds of reeds. And um, they would use a reed, they'd cut it and use it to make a pen or maybe a hairbread or something like that. Or just think of it in the sense of a flower. If you go out in your garden and a dog's been in your garden overnight, and he's caused the flowers to be broken or bent over. What are you going to do? Just leave them bent over like that? And you're going to cut them up, and, but you can't straighten them up. They're, they're, once it's bent, it's bent, and you can't. So what we do is we cut it off and put it in a vase or, or, or toss it. Jesus says, or uh, Matthew, Matthew, Isaiah says, a bruised reed, a bent flower, he's not going to cut it off and throw it away. He's going to heal it, make it straight. He's not talking about reeds. He's talking about people. So it's. he, he uses that word reed to illustrate people. Same thing with the smoking flax. Um, we don't use a lot of smoking flax today. Let's say a, a, a candle or a, a flashlight. When the battery's dead or going dead, what do you do? Well, you take it out and put a new one in. Take the old battery and you what? Well, you store it for memories and no, you throw it away. It's, it's junk. It's trash. A bruised reed, a almost dead battery, he's not going to take out and throw away. He's going to cause it to be vibrant once again. That's the idea. Now, we can talk about uh, smoking flax and try to understand what that was. Basically, it's a candle wick, and uh, you know, when it gets down to the short part, you, you snuff it out, you put a new one in, you throw out the old one. Jesus says, or Matt, Isaiah said, Jesus won't do that. But he's not talking about literal flax and literal uh, reeds. He's making the application to people. And you go throughout, and this is where I take this lesson, you go throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you see the broken reeds or bruised reeds that Jesus comes up on. The the the, the bleeding woman who had the, been bleeding for 12 years. So she's unclean for 12 years. She can't touch her husband. She can't touch her kids. She can't go to church. She can't do anything because she's considered unclean. She goes to the market. She touches people. People cuss her out because she's unclean. She made them unclean. So she's isolated. She's sick. She's gone to doctors and can't get any better. And the Jewish culture has thrown her aside. They, she's a bruised reed, and they just cut her off and get away from us. Don't come near Jesus. Made her whole. And he did something in that particular instance that he didn't do in any other, any other recorded place. He called her my daughter. For 12 years, she's been ostracized by her Jewish community. And now, by the Son of God, he calls her my daughter. A bruised reed, and yet he makes her whole. The woman, 
apply it to people. But uh, I mean, look at the woman in John chapter 8, the woman who was dragged out of her bed because she's in the midst of adult, committing adultery. And the people, Jesus in, ended up uh, saying, no, he is, has the first stone, who, he is without sin, cast the first stone. They all went away and he talked to the woman. He says, <clears throat> where are your accusers? I don't know, Lord, they've all gone. And he says, well, I don't accuse you either. I mean, he, he spiritually heals her. She was an ostracized person. She was going to be and could have legally been destroyed or stoned to death that day. But Jesus, instead of throwing her away, he takes that bruised reed and stands her up straight and makes her be the flower that God intended for her to be. The application is for you and I. That's what Jesus did. What are you doing in your life with the bruised reeds, the smoking flax? Are you casting them aside? I ain't got anything need time for that. I don't need to deal with that. You know, when people become damaged goods in life, our society oftentimes throws them out. Christians, in light of our relationship with Christ, we don't throw them out. We do what we can to make them better. We make them do what we can to make them be the flower that God intended them to be, the bright flame that God intended it for them to be. Whether it's a person who's handicapped or a person who is poor, or a person who's homeless, we can take them and with the love and compassion of, of Christ, we can give them the opportunity. They won't always do it, but we can give them the opportunity to be the flower, the reed that God wants them to be. Heal them rather than destroy them. That's what that passage means. Jesus came to do that. And I love that passage. I gave you a condensed version of what people have been hearing me preach about for hours. <laughs> but I, I love that passage. You done got me distracted now. Um, where, are we, where are we? Uh, I will open my, Matthew chapter 13. I think that's where we left off. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them. Verse 35, that it might be fulfilled by the which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open his mouth, or my mouth, in parables I will utter things that uh, kept secret from the foundation of the world. So Jesus spoke in parables. Why? Well, one of the reasons is to teach people, but one of the reasons is that's what the prophet said he would do. And uh, Isaiah is, Jesus is not trying to, let me go up here and find all the prophecies and then do what the prophecies say I have to do. Matthew is pointing out after the fact. He, he's speaking to people who, who live 20 or 30 years after Jesus. And I want you to see, go back and look. This prophecy said that the one who comes, the king, he's somebody who's going to speak in parables. What did Jesus do? You remember, you were there. What did he do? Well, he spoke in parables. He fulfilled the prophecy. That's what Matthew's doing in, in, in these passages. Matthew 21, last week in Jesus' life, uh, I think there's a lot of symbolic actions that take place that take place in this particular passage. Matthew chapter 21, he comes in as a humble king into Jerusalem. Verse, he says, now when they drew near, that is Jesus and the disciples, drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, the word Bethphage means house of figs. They came to the house of figs, the town called house of figs, at the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village, that is to the house of figs village, opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them, bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. That tells me that Jesus knew that somebody, some angel, some message of God had gone to prepare that person who owns that colt and donkey, saying that the Messiah is going to come and ask you for that. And Jesus said that he'll know that and he'll, he'll send it with you. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt to follow a donkey. Donkey... He's not a beast of war. It's not a beast that a king's going to ride. It's a beast of humility. We oftentimes refer to it as a beast of burden. Jesus is referred to often in the New Testament as Lord, but here in this particular text, it says, if anyone says anything to you, say to him, the Lord. The word the is not always included in the reference to Jesus as the Lord. And the word Lord 
is kurios in the Greek, which can be translated as king. But here it says, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord. Ho kurios is the word in Greek, has need of them. It's Matthew's point to his audience for them to see the connection between the prophetic voices and the Messiah. What did Zechariah say? What did Isaiah say? What did Hosea say? What did all these prophets say? And then what did you see Jesus do? He fulfilled those prophecies. And again, he didn't have a, a checklist. Let me say, I got this one, this one, this one, this one. I got that one done. I got that one done. So I got to fulfill these. That's not the way it was. Even if that's the way it was, it would still be true. But Jesus didn't do it like that. He, he lived his life and his life fulfilled those prophecies. And Matthew saying, you were there. You saw it happening. You must know that he is uh, the one. He is the king. The king has arrived. In Matthew 26, uh, Matthew 26 and 27 are the last two places where Matthew does this. Uh, and one of them is the place where <clears throat> Judas betrays Jesus and the place where Jesus is arrested. Verse 26, or chapter 26, verse 50, but Jesus said to him, friend, why have you come? Then they, lay, they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him, and suddenly one of those who were with him uh, were with Jesus, stretched out his hand, drew a sword, struck the servant on the high, uh, of the high priest, cut off his ear, but Jesus said to him, put your sword up. Put your sword in this place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you not... The, Think that I cannot <clears throat> now pray to my Father, and he will provide me with twelve legions of angels? How then sh could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen like this? If you take the sword, or if God sends twelve legions of angels to stop this from happening, then we will not be able to fulfill the prophets. We must let things take place so that the prophecies can be fulfilled. In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out against me as a robber, a sword, and cubs to take me? I sat daily with you teaching the temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled, and all the disciples forsook him and fled. So Jesus knew what was going to happen because he read the prophets, and he knew it must happen this way. Chapter 27, verse 3, Then Judas his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, for sure, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, that's your problem, not mine. What is that to us? See, you see to it. Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple, departed, and went and hanged himself. But the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because now it's blood money. Uh, they have consulted, so they consulted together and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, the field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by the Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was pierced, priced, uh, whom they, of the children of Israel, priced, and gave them for the potter's field of the Lord. So here we find not Jesus fulfilling the prophecy, but a prophecy about Jesus was fulfilled by the priest who hated Jesus, that had tried to hire or did hire Judas to betray him that he might be fulfilled. They ended up with the money back, needed to do something, can't put it in the treasure, his blood money, even though it was their bloody hands. That, but at any rate, their inconsistencies, nevertheless, uh, they said, we can't do that, so we'll just buy the potter's field and let uh, poor people be, be buried there. But they didn't know that they were fulfilling. If they had any kind of understanding of scriptures, they would have known. They didn't know that they were fulfilling their prophecies about uh, Jesus. <clears throat> now, having seen all these prophecies, if we had been there with Jesus, if Anne and Vincent and Mike had been there with Jesus and the Jews, what would we have done? How would we have seen Jesus? Would we have said, whoa, I read about that back there in Hosea. That sounds like he's fulfilling that prophecy. Or I read the book of Isaiah last week, and I saw all these things about the coming one. And this guy, Jesus, he, he fulfilled every one of them. Would we have done that? They didn't. Before you answer, I want you to look at one more. And I skipped it initially. It's actually back in chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1. 
I knew we were going to come back to this, so I skipped it in the beginning. I plotted against you. <laughs> I planned it ahead of time. So all this was done, verse 22, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with them. Well, again, we find Matthew quoting from a prophet 800 years uh, prior, a promise of, of God. And, and Matthew wants us to see that when God makes a promise in his word, God will fulfill that promise in this world. Even if it's a ridiculous promise, or what we might perceive as a ridiculous promise, a virgin shall conceive. <laughs> That doesn't happen. You're right, it doesn't happen. But when God acts in this world, it can happen. It did happen. When God makes a promise, no matter how absurd we might think it might be, God is going to fulfill that promise so that it can be seen. He'll make a promise with his word, but it'll be seen in this world. So he wants us to see that this is all a part of God's plan. This is all a part of God's promise. When God... Uh, Peter's trying to tell me something. When God originally made this promise through Isaiah, this virgin birth promise, he was speaking to a faithless king, King Asa. Uh, Asa was afraid that the enemies of Israel were going to come and, and completely destroy uh, the Jews and thus eliminate God's promise that was made through Abraham. As faithless as Asa was, he believed that God had made a promise to Abraham, and he believed that God would fulfill that promise. And if Israel's enemies are going to do what it seems they're going to do, God's not going to do that. And so Isaiah comes to Asa, and he says, I'm going to give you a sign by which you will know that God will fulfill his promise. And it is the sign of the virgin, the uh, the that uh a virgin will, will conceive. That's a pretty significant sign. <laughs> uh, and Asa, uh, his understanding of that promise was corrupt. Nevertheless, Isaiah said, this is what's going to happen. Or at least the enemies of Israel are not going to come and destroy you and violate God's promise to Abraham. And the sign is, I, I, I'll give you a sign. One day a virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. That's a pretty big sign. If, anybody, if that ever happens, you're going to know something significant is happening. He will, that is the one that's conceived, the one that's born, will be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. And when that happens, Asa, all Israel will know for sure that God has the power to fulfill his promise and that he's about to do so. Well, Asa didn't see that promise fulfilled. Some people say that uh, Isaiah... This is a dual promise or dual sign that uh, he was referring to the Virgin Mary 800 years in the future, but it could also be applied to his own wife. But I don't really go along with that because his wife was not a virgin. Uh, the word that's used for virgin would refer to a young unmarried and it doesn't always have to mean virgin, but it most of the time does mean it. Mostly, you know, it, first and foremost, I suppose, it's a young maiden, but it's typically a young virgin maiden. But Isaiah's wife was neither. She was neither a young maiden nor a virgin. She was Isaiah's wife, and therefore she's not a virgin. At any rate, um, some people say that uh, Isaiah's son, uh, do you know Isaiah's son's name? Very few people know this. It's one of the longest names in the Bible, probably the second longest name in the Bible. May her shall I has baths. You need to learn that name because it's actually important uh, more than just more, more than just for the uh, the uh, uh, uniqueness of the name. The, the name meaning the name has a meaning that was part of the sign, part of another. Sign. Mayor shall have has baths. Isaiah comes in having a sign of his, uh, above his head. Mayor shall have has baths. Mayor shall have has baths. Turns out to be the name of his son, but it has a meaning. But that's a whole different story. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> um, 
I want to say it's Isaiah chapter 8 or 9, but I, I, I don't have that in my notes right now. I'd have to go look it up. Uh, when King Asa didn't believe Isaiah, uh, and unfortunately, 800 years later, the Jews didn't believe it when God actually fulfilled the sign. But Matthew says, this was done, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet. The prophet said, Asa, to prove to you that God can keep his promise, I'm going to make the most ridiculous promise that you could ever think of, and God will fulfill it. And that is, a virgin shall conceive. And Isaiah said, or Matthew says in chapter 1, God did it. It didn't take him 800 years. He waited 800 years. But nevertheless, God fulfilled that uh, promise. And that's the reality that I want to bring home to, to each of us. The God we come to worship. The God who gives you promises in his, his word. Whatever that promise is, however ridiculous that, that promise may sound, you can count on it. He will fulfill it in this world. He always, the faithfulness of God, uh, <clears throat> when Moses told God, I asked God one time, he said, I need to see who you are. I need to be able to prove to these people that I'm following the right God. I'm leading them in the right way. Can you show me who you are? And God says, well, I can't show you everything because you can't bear it, but I'll show you my hinder parts. And when the hinder parts of God passed by, when God had passed by, he took, God took a uh, veil off of Moses' face and he said, this is what Moses said I saw. I saw uh, mercy. I saw forgiveness. I saw long suffering. I saw God abounding in truth and faithfulness. That word faithfulness there means I all, God always fulfills his promises. One of the characteristics of God that you can absolutely depend upon, along with his forgiveness, along with his grace, along with his mercy, you can absolutely depend upon the fact that he will fulfill his promise. Even if it's a ridiculous promise like a virgin conceiving a child without the aid of a man. God says to Anne, and God says to Vincent, and God says to Mike, I will never leave you. Do you believe it? I mean, we have to not just say, I believe it, just like people, oh, I believe in Jesus, want him to be Lord of my life. you got to actually let that happen. If you believe that God will never forsake you, then you need to act in this world in such a way that demonstrates, I believe the Lord will never forsake you. God has promised, I will, never, I will supply all of your needs according to the, the glories of the riches of Christ. And we need to ask ourselves, do we believe that? God promised, I will supply all of your needs according to the glorious riches of Christ Jesus. But do we believe it? The Bible says, where God promises neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor present, nor future, or powers, or height, or depth, or anything else in all of his creation will ever be able to separate you from my love. Do you believe it? Or is it just words that the Bible says, oh, I believe it because God, you know, it's in the Bible. But do we actually believe it? Does our life demonstrate that we believe it? I, Asa believed that God made promises. But when Isaiah says uh, God's going to cause a virgin to become pregnant and bring forth a child, he will be Emmanuel. That stretched Asa's belief probably further than he was willing to, to go. You and I are a part of God's church, part of his called out people. Uh, and as such, John writes in the book of Revelation, there at the end he says there's no more reason for tears, no more reason for mourning, no more reason for there's no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. A lot of times we associate that with heaven. That's what it's going to be like in heaven. John wasn't talking about heaven. He's talking about the church here on earth. What do you mean, John? No more death. My my father's in the church. He's going to die. Or he's sick and died or, or, or 
whatever. It's too much spiritual death in Christ, in the church. We have no more reason for crying. There's no more separation from God. There's no more spiritual pain, no more spiritual sickness because Jesus has died for us. Do you believe it? It's one thing to say it. And one thing to say, well, that's what the scripture says, but do we believe it that God has taken away, truly taken away that separation which we brought into our life? This is the God that we worship. And we need to decide if we believe his promises, no, regardless of how odd or difficult we might think that promise is to uh, fulfill. We see it disrespectful. The question is, Vincent, if a Christian dies, shouldn't we be happy? And I think in one sense, no, we're all human. And if it's my mother, my wife, or, or my daughter, or whatever that, that passes away, that's going to just wrench my heart. But if I know that God's promises are true, I can be happy. I don't have to suffer in pain. All right. That's right. And we're, we're told by counselors and whatever that when someone has died, you don't go to the spouse or the child or whatever and say, well, they're in a better place. But I understand what they're saying, but at the same time, we should be able to be comforted with that knowledge that, yes, they're in a better place. I know that. I shouldn't be offended by that. And um, I, I think the counselors are right in the sense that people are offended by that in that hour of grief. But if we truly have the faith that Isaiah was asking Asa to have and that Matthew is telling us that we should have, then no, I'm not offended by that. It is true. God did take them home. God, they are in a better place and I should have joy. I'm still hurting because they're no longer a part of my life. I can't walk arm in arm with them anymore, but I know they're in a better place. I think that you're exactly right. Right. Because it's not true, unfortunately. It's unfortunate. Yeah. That's one of the promises we have as believers. They are in a better place. And Paul said to Timothy in Second Timothy, he says, I'm ready to go. Uh, they're going to chop off my head. Don't cry for me, Timothy. I'm going to be in a better place. He told the Philippians, he says, you know what? I'm going to straight betwixt two. Uh, I want to go home and be with God, but I'm, I need to be here for your benefit. <laughs> he, that's right. And him staying here, him staying here ended up costing him his life. And, and he went through several more years of persecution and torment. He said, I'm willing to do that for your sake, but I want to go home now, to a better place. So yeah, believers do have that promise and we need to act like it is a real promise that we actually believe. Somebody says, well, do you want to go to heaven? The fellow said, uh, well, are you trying to get a bus load up right now? No, but <laughs> if I were, you should be the first one on it. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of the miracle of the birth of Christ is the name that was given Jesus, Emmanuel. The word Jesus, as we talked about earlier, means Savior. But he was given another name that we don't often use, but when we hear it, it's, it's a soft spot, I think, in our hearts. Emmanuel, it, it translated, Matthew, it's one of those Greek words that or Hebrew words that we don't have to go look in the concordance. Matthew translates it for us. He says it means God with us. Our God, our awesome God, our creator God, the God of the universe, the God who spoke the world into the existence, the God who, who brought the starry host into existence by one word, the God who, who, who raises the, the mountain peaks, the God, the God who scoops out the oceans, the God, the God who makes the whale and the minnow, this God says, I am with you. Do you believe it? At the very start of the gospel, this is the God who is with you. His name is Emmanuel. Do you believe it? 
And does your life demonstrate that belief? Well, as I said, we need to uh, move on, but we need to take a break. We're already past the break time, so we'll stop here for about five minutes and come back, and we will actually move into Matthew chapter 3. Uh, Vincent, if you can hear me, we're going to take a little bit of a break, uh, but we'll come back and we're going to talk about the wise man. All right. I'll leave the recording going. Okay.
Let's uh, try to move on. Um, tell me everything you know about the three wise men at the birth of Christ. Let me stop you right there. First of all, there were no wise men at the birth of Christ. It was a trick. It was a trick question. I stumped you right off the bat. <laughs> there were no wise men at the birth of Christ. It messes everybody's nativity scene up, I know. But according to the Bible, there were only shepherds at the birthplace. No wise men. The wise men did come, and they, as you were going to say, did follow a star or a light. But that was some time later, probably a few months, maybe even as much as a year later. They did not come to the birth event of uh, Jesus. Matthew says that wise men came to see the king, Jesus, after the family had moved from the barn in which Jesus was born to a house. They were still in Bethlehem, apparently, but they're no longer in the barn. Uh, they were in a house. Now, when I say barn, Middle Eastern culture of that time, they didn't have that big red barn out there in the field like we have a barn could have been a room under a house. There are still cultures that that takes place today where we lived in Russia. One of the um, members or one of the people I visited one time, they lived in a house, but dug out from the bottom of the house was a uh, uh, an area where their cow slept. And when you lived in the top part of the house, you could smell that that's where the cow was in the bottom. But that was the, the barn. They kept it from the the cold and everything. They, I don't think it was a milk cow. I think it was a cow they were raising for beef. But at any rate, the barn was simply a dugout place from under the, the house. Um, probably in Jesus' day, the, uh, where there was not a big red barn facility out in somebody's field, it was probably a room carved out under a house or maybe a cave that was carved out uh, of a hill. Uh, you know, th this story comes from a Middle Eastern uh, setting, not from America. And if we can make our minds think that uh, when Jesus was born in a barn, is that you or me? Okay, good. Uh, 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 it makes more sense when we look at it from a Middle Eastern perspective. So um, who were these guys, these three wise men? And is it really important to, to know? And the reason I say three is because when you go to the Kroger store or Walmart at Christmas time to buy your Christmas card and you open up the Hallmark card, there's going to be how many wise men there? There's going to be three wise men. And why do we say there's three wise men? Well, because they had three gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So if there are three gifts, there must have been three wise men. Well, 
Yes, there could have been three wise men bearing three grip, three gifts. There could have been two wise men bearing three gifts. There could have gifts. There could have been a hundred wise men bearing three gifts. All of them could have have three apiece, or eight, there were three gifts presented: gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Ever how many people brought it? There were three gifts, but we don't know how many wise men there were. Uh, but again, if you say there are more than three or less than three, then you mess up everybody's nativity scene and, and, their, and their Christmas cards. And nobody likes their Christmas cards and nativity scenes to be um, messed up. So uh, there's a lot of folklore out there about these guys. Some say they were actually king. Some say that they were uh, representatives of the family of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, some say, Hallmark scholars, <laughs> I call them, say that their names, we have names for them. Their names are Casper, Balthazar, and Melchor. Now, where do we get that? Well, I don't know, but it's not in the Bible. But we have given names to our three wives. Not only have we said that there are three, we've given them names. Some will go on to say that one of them was a Greek, one of them was an Ethiopian, one of them was an Indian, that is from India. And they were later baptized by the Apostle Thomas. You can read this stuff out there and given to us by those who claim to be scholars. Where do they get the information? I don't know. In the 12th century, there was a Bishop Reinhold of, the, uh, of Cologne who said he found the bones of the wise men. And he knew right off it was the three wise men. They rose up and told him, I guess. I don't know. But they are now, their bones are in a golden sarcophagus, uh, an exhibit over there in the Cathedral of Cologne in Europe. Sometime later, that was investigated. And the bones in the casket that... Reinhold had found, who he claims are the three wise men. How he could know that is beyond my knowledge. But at any rate, it was found that the bones belong one to a youth, one to a middle-aged man, and one to an elderly man. We can figure out from DNA how old these people were. Now, if that's the case, if they were baptized by Thomas, it had to be 35 years or more after the time that we see them in Matthew chapter 3 because Matthew chapter 3 Jesus is a baby maybe a year old Thomas doesn't come into the life of Jesus until Jesus is around 30 to 33 years old Thomas didn't do his evangelism until a little bit later so anywhere somewhere between 35 and 50 years later let's just say lowest estimate 35 years later so if B Thomas baptized them the youngest uh, would have been about 40 years old at that time. If, if he were only five years old when he met Jesus there at the, uh, at, at the birth. But again, the facts don't match or these bones don't match the story. But if you go out telling people that, going to mess up their Christmas scenes and the people who, over there in Cologne who are collecting money for us to go over there and see those bones or see that sarcophagus you're really going to make them mad because they believe they have the bones of the three wise men although we don't know that there were three and the story that goes with the bones or that has to go with the bones just doesn't fit the facts or can't fit the facts but that's all it doesn't matter because as long as you're making money, it's it, you're good to go. Yeah, I'm gonna say that these three, yeah, it was three wise men staying together that long where they would die together. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's just oh, it's it, it doesn't it doesn't matter, and you know it, what matters is is we have these bones. They're holy bones. They're in our holy sarcophagus, and I charge you twenty bucks to come in and see it. If you got twenty bucks, you can believe what you want to. Just give me the twenty bucks. Well, that's the way religion works, uh, unfortunately. Actually, we're very limited on what we can know about these men. From inspiration, here's what we have. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. That's it. We don't know if it was three. We don't know it's 53. We don't know their ages. We don't know how many. We don't know if they rode camels or donkeys or were afoot. Now, we all know that, according to Hallmark, they're on camels. They all have a camel. But... 
the only thing that we can know for sure is that after they left Jerusalem, they picked up a little drummer boy to show them the way to Bethlehem, and the only thing the drummer boy had to give Jesus was a rumpa pum pum. That's fact. I mean, just, we know that to be a matter of fact. Actually, what I want to do tonight uh, with the remainder of our time, which is not much, but I want to present to you some statements from Scripture and place them in the context of secular history so that we can maybe draw some conclusions. I won't say they're facts, but I think we can draw, at least I have drawn, and I want to give you at least that idea uh, uh, to, if you want to draw the, the conclusions that I have, have drawn. My purpose is twofold. One, I want to develop a broader picture of what we have here in Matthew chapter 3 of who these wise men might be. And two, I want us to see that if my conclusions are true, that God has been working with these guys long before they were ever born or thought of by human, humankind. <clears throat> Was God in the three wise men story, just giving us more Christmas tradition and fodder? Or is there another reason why these three men, or these men, here I am saying three, uh, these men, these wise men are found in Matthew chapter 3 without explanation. They are the only, uh, we don't know how many it was. Oh, uh, I, say, I said three is two, you're correct. Uh, Matthew chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> I think there's more to the story than what the, the typical Christmas story here. These are the only non-Jewish characters in this very Jewish book of Matthew uh, that are significant in the story. And I want us to see if we can determine, is there a reason why these guys are spotlighted like they are? So to do that, we need to go way back in history fellow by the name of Balaam. You ever heard of Balaam? I'm sure you have. B-A-L-A-A-M. He was about he was about 1500 years before Jesus. He is the guy who talked to his donkey, which is no big surprise because men who have donkeys talk to their donkeys. The big surprise was what? The donkey talked back. Uh, and interesting, as interesting and amazing as that event is, there's a couple of particulars about that story that I want to talk about that may have relationship to what we find here in Matthew chapter 2. First of all, Balaam was a prophet of God, and the Bible says he was a man from the east. Now, from where were the wise men? The one fact that we know about the wise men is, one, they were wise, two, they were men, and three, they were from the east. Balaam was from the east. Balaam, if we go back to his story, he was, you might say, the hired gun of a man named Balak. Balak was an enemy king to the people of God, and he was looking to get rid of God's people. He wanted God's people destroyed. This is why they're still in the wilderness wanderings. Balak wants to rid the earth of these Jewish people, so Balak hires Balaam, a man from the east, a prophet of God from the east, uh, to come over and curse these people so that they will will die. Well, Balaam says, first up, first off to, and we'll get to this in a minute, to Balak, he says, I'll come, but the only thing I can do is whatever God says do. Uh, I'll take your money, but whatever comes out of my mouth is what God is going to make come out of my mouth. Well, Balak still hired him, nevertheless. Um, and it, from all appearances, because Balaam comes from the east and Israel never did come from the east. Uh, they came from uh, Canaan. Under well, Jake, uh, Abraham came from um, Ur the Chaldee, which that's about as far east as we can trace any Jewish descent. He came from Ur. He went up to Haran. He came down to Canaan, dwelt there or lived there as a, uh, a wanderer for the years of his life. Isaac came, then Jacob came, then the 12 sons came, and they, Jacob and the 12 sons went to Egypt. 
then they were rescued from Egypt, and they were out here in the wilderness. And it's while they're in the wilderness that Balak hires Balaam from the east, uh, out there from Mesopotamia, most likely, somewhere off the Euphrates. Uh, probably not the same exact geographic area of the wise men of chapter 2. We'll talk about that in a bit. But close. From a world scale, they're they're closer to the he's closer a lot closer to the east than we are here. Uh, but anyway, he's in the same general or from the same general area that these wise men will come from later on. We'll speak about that in a minute. But what I want to do is put in your mind that there may be a connection between this guy Balaam and these guys from the east, even though it's remote. It's, no, it's not too distant, but no, distant, but not too distant. They're somewhere in the same geographic location. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, so just make a note that they're, we're trying to make a connection between Balaam, who was from the east, and the wise men who were from the east. The second thing about Balaam that relates to Matthew chapter 2 is a prophecy that he made. I'll ask you to turn to Numbers chapter 24. Numbers chapter 24, <clears throat> verse 10, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. It's the uh, fourth book. Numbers 24. Then Balak, that's the bad guy who's hiring Balaam to curse Israel. Balak's anger was aroused against Balaam. And he struck his hands together, and Balak said to Balaam, I called you here to curse my enemies, and look, you have bountifully blessed them these three times. Now, therefore, flee. Go to your place. I said I would greatly honor you, but in fact, the Lord has kept you back from honor because you would not do what I asked you because you wanted to do what God said do. Then he has kept you back from me being able to honor you. Verse 12. So Balaam said to Balak, the guy that was hired to curse, said to the guy who hired him to curse them, did I not also speak to your messengers whom you sent to me, saying, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do good or bad of my own will. What the Lord says, that I must speak. Now I'll take your money. But I can only do what the Lord says do. Now, God told Balaam in the beginning, we don't have this conversation here. It's recorded there for us. I'm not going to go into it. But God told Balaam, Balaam Balak's messengers came and said, I'll pay you to come curse. And Balaam told, goes to God, what should I do? God says, leave him alone. Don't do anything. And then Balaam comes back. Well, what should I do? Leave him alone. Don't do anything. And Balaam comes back and says, well, what should I do? And God said, well, you just do what you want to do. <laughs> Because you're going to do that anyway. So he did. He took the money. Uh, but he did hold to his convictions and say, you know, I'll take your money, but I'm going to do what God says do. Uh, there's a whole other story there that Jude and Peter both rebuke Balaam for his materialistic, uh, for his covetousness. But that's not part of our story here. Verse um, 13, if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord to do bad or too good or bad of my own what the Lord says I will do. I'm going to speak. And now indeed I'm going, I am going to my people. They, like I said, go away, get away from me. And so he said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go away. But come, before I go, I want to advise you what this people, what these people of Israel will do to your people in later days. I'm going to give you a message you don't want to hear. So he took up his oracle and said, the utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, and the utterance of the man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and has knowledge of the Most High, who sees the visions of the Almighty, who falls down with his eyes wide open. Verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab and destroy all the sons of Tumor. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ that Balaam gives. A star out of uh, uh, Jacob, a scepter out of uh, Israel. Some take this as a little literal reference to the star that the wise men saw. I don't think so, but uh, the scepter is an obvious reference to a king. King has a scepter. 
Jesus is that king. It's the same prophecy that's given to us by Jacob back in uh, Genesis chapter 49, verse 10, that a king will come from Judah uh, who has a scepter. Now, with all that information, I want to switch gears, and we'll come back to it, but I want to switch gears and talk about this word in Matthew chapter 2 that's translated in your Bibles as wise man or wise men. It's the Greek word magos, the plural of which is magi. Maybe at Christmas time you'll hear people talk about the magi, or they call them in English magi. Maybe you've heard of the Magi. Well, that's to whom we're referring here. The Greek word is magos for singular, and magi, or as some people say it, magi in English. And we get our word magic from this word magi. Uh, but I don't want you to think of David Copperfield when we think of these wise men. That's not the idea. That's how the word has been corrupted in English, but that's not really the, the idea. I googled the word and found that there uh, is actually a, you know what anime is? When you were growing up, you watched uh, cartoons. Well, today they watch anime. It's a form of cartoons, I guess, and it's more oriental uh, in, in nature. But the, anyway, there's an anime series called The Magi, or The Magi, and of course, there are three of them. Nevertheless, the Magi, of which Matthew speaks, were not magicians as we think of them. They, they, they don't take rabbits out of the hat or cut their, their assistants in half. If you're familiar with the, the wizards of um, Harry Potter, the, the books of Harry Potter it would be closer to that. Uh, that kind of uh, person is who these magi are. That said, there are or were some among the magi who would use their wisdom, who would use their knowledge to deceive people, and they would pull the rabbit out of the hat or cut their, they wouldn't cut their assistant's hat, but they would do so-called magical tricks, hocus pocus, in order to deceive people and get money from them, and uh, we'll see actually some of those in the New Testament. Uh, Simon Magus uh, from Acts chapter 8 uh, was, uh, that word is used to describe uh, who he was. He was a, a Magi. And we'll, I'll try to explain that later on. But at any rate, there was a Jewish philosopher named Philo who despised these people because they, he called them vipers, scorpions, and other venomous creatures because my opinion is probably someone sold him some snake oil and he found out what it was. But at any rate, <laughs> according to historians, a man by the name Herodotus, a historian, he says the Magi of old were a priestly tribe or the priestly tribe of the eastern nation of the Medes, M-E-D-E-S, the Medes. You don't hear a lot about the Medes because they were kind of absorbed into the Persians. But you will read about them in the book of Daniel. You hear about uh, Darius the Mede. Um, the Medes and the Persians collaborated somewhat to, or at least I think were led first by the Medes, and later on the Persians became a part of it, and the Persians became the greater part of it later on. They are the ones that took over uh, Babylon. Uh, and you can see that recorded for us not only in the book of Daniel, but in your uh, history books. And if the historians are correct, the ones that Daniel in his book calls wise men in the courts of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon, they were also in the courts of Persia and the courts of the Medes. They are the Magi, they, a tribe uh, from which these men in Matthew chapter 2 came centuries uh, later. They're not the same men, but they're the same family. The tribe that existed in Daniel's time still existed in Jesus' time, and these men from the east were of that tribe of Magi. Just like the, the Jewish nation is made up of 12 tribes. Well, they weren't the only nation that had tribes. Tribes simply is family. Uh, there's the Underwood tribe uh, from which I come, and then there's the Noblin tribe from which my wife comes, and the two tribes have come together. Well, the Jews had 12 tribes. The, Mag uh, the Medes also were a tribal nation, and the Magi were one of those tribes, and they were called or used as the priestly 
tribe of the Median, Median uh, nation. So they're very ancient people. They didn't just pop up during the time of Daniel. They had been there for a long time. And some historians trace uh, the Medes all the way back to the time of uh, Abraham when Ur, he came out of Ur the Chaldees. Some people, some historians believe the Medes were there in Ur the Chaldees. I can't give you any facts about that. That's just what some have said. And some think that Balaam, being from the east, could very likely have been of that tribe. Now, Balaam would have been... Uh, close to a thousand years before Daniel, and then therefore close to uh, 1,500 years before Christ. But I'm just trying to indicate that if he were one of the Magi tribe, that tribe goes way back to the time of, uh, or could go back to the time of Balaam, even as far as back as Abraham, another 500 uh, years. According to history and according to inspiration, uh, Daniel, the Medes, along with the Persians, defeated uh, the and took over Babylon. They later, the Medes and the Persians were defeated by Alexander the Great, but they still continued to exist. Alexander didn't come in and kill all the Medes and the Persians; he just defeated them. And so, the Medes and the Persians, and therefore the Magi tribe, at least some of them, continued to. Uh, live and evidence shows us, historical evidence shows us that they continued into the time of the Roman Empire when Christ was born. You'll read, read them even after the time of the Roman Empire. So they were an ancient tribe and they continued up in, even until, even in, into the time of Christ. And the point is that the word Matthew used to describe them, the Magos or the Magi, it's not so much a, a word, the wise men, it's a name. It tells us their family, who they they were, why they were Magi. They were from the tribe of the Medes called the Magi. And this tribe of the Magi, according to historians, were very skilled in astronomy and astrology. Back then, they didn't make a big difference between the science and the superstition. They were occultists. They believed that they had a, a means of divination. They could learn the future by reading uh, the stars. And, you know, you and I, we see that as hocus pocus, and we go to the uh, newspaper and read our, what's it called? Uh, yeah, I want to say obituary, but that's not right. <laughs> Horoscope. And, you know, they're, 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 somebody's reading the uh, the stars and telling me what my, you know, I, I don't believe that for a moment, but a lot of people do. Now, you and I see it as superstition. Some people see it as fact. You do not walk where a black cat has been, you do not walk under a ladder, and you do what your horoscope says, or that's what's going to happen, and so it's real to them, and if you go back to the time of Jesus, if you go back to the time of Daniel, it was more real to them, it was more accepted, you know, probably the larger part of society in America anyway, they don't go in for all that superstitious mess, and don't believe it, you can go to cultures today, uh, I, I was in Africa, in, in Nigeria, and it's very strong over there, superstition is, uh, but you go back to Daniel's time, and that was the way of life. If you didn't believe it, there was something wrong with you. Uh, you're crazy, but you don't believe in in this. So it was believed that there were sorcerers, uh, uh, that there were people who could divine the future by supernatural means, reading the bones or looking at the stars or, or whatever. And it's because it was believed that they were sorcerers that the word magos or magi was corrupted throughout history and became known to us, uh, comes down to us as the word magic or magician, uh, which is a synonym for a sorcerer. But the magi were originally just a uh, pagan priestly tribe of, of people from the Medes. They were sorcerers in the sense that people superstitiously believe that they had the, some kind of divine co connection with the divine, with the occult. Well, what's inter interesting about this, and I know I'm probably boring you to tears, but I'm, I am going to a point uh, that during the time of the Babylonian Empire, these or men from this tribe, this Magian tribe, were a part of the Babylonian court. When Nebuchadnezzar wanted to go to war, he would call the Magi. What should I do? Tell me what your understanding is. Or if he had a dream, 
What is the meaning of this dream? Or something happened on his way to work. He would call the Magi. What did this mean? Is there something behind that? So they were a part of his council, his cabinet, his advisors, just like our president today has a cabinet of, of advisors. We hope they're not sorcerers. Uh, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar had them. They were sorcerers, and that's what was expected. Everybody did it. Every king had their magicians, had their sorcerers. Uh, and if you had the best, then you, they were of the Magian tribe, the Magi tribe. And so Nebuchadnezzar, being the world ruler that he was, he had the best of uh, the best. They could predict, they could speak for the gods, they could speak uh, for the, the, the future. And it was so thoroughly believed that they could do this. They, they were used as advisors throughout uh, the world, and they were Nebuchadnezzar's chief advisors and placed there in a prominence of a uh, place of prominence in the Babylonian court. And uh, the Medes and Persians who came uh, later used them uh, as, as well as, to, as did the Greeks and the Romans. In that Babylonian court where the Magians or Magi were Nebuchadnezzar's counselors, there was a man named Daniel. He was not of the Magian tribe. Initially, Nebuchadnezzar thought of Daniel in the same way that he thought of the Magi. He, Daniel was one of the wise men from the Judean tribe, and he, uh, from the uh, people of Israel that he had captured. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, when he'd go into any culture or any place and capture them, he would take out the, the best. He would take out their counselors and their wise men and make them his, train them to be his. So that's what he did from Israel. He took Daniel and his three friends, and there were more, but the three Daniel and his three friends are the ones that we read about in the scriptures, and he trained them to be his wise men or among his counselors because he believed that they had those powers. But when they first came, the Magi were still the chief advisors to Babylon, and Daniel was just this guy here. But when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream that no one could interpret, and he was going to kill all the Magi and make their houses a dunghill. Daniel stepped up and says, I can interpret the dream. And uh, one thing to say it, another thing to do it, but then he did it, and then Daniel has the respect of everyone. Now these Magi, whether or not they believe they had those powers or they were faking that they had those powers, uh, when they saw Daniel actually had communication with God, Daniel had their attention. He had Nebuchadnezzar's attention, but he's also got the attention of these Magi. If you were a sincere Magian uh, wise person, and you actually thought that when you read the stars, that's what the future is, and when you give the future, you actually believe this. Now, some were deceptive, but I think there had to be among them probably some honest ones. If you were among those uh, people and you found this Daniel who, man, he could predict it right on every time. It's, you know, he, he always gets it right. Uh, what kind of respect would you have for this Daniel? Well, I want to sit at his feet. I want to learn from him because he's got the goods. And so my opinion is, and this is nothing I can prove to you from history, but, <clears throat> or from Bible, my opinion is that Daniel had influence over these men. There is obvious interaction between them and Daniel in the book of uh, Daniel in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. But I had to have to believe that when he was elevated to that, that place that he had some influence over and some relationship with these Magi. Now, if you're Daniel the prophet and you have this open opportunity to speak with these pagan priests or these pagan superstitious people, and you're a prophet of God and you're trying to show people the way of God, what are you going to tell them? Well, I'm going to do what I can do to convince them, just like he's doing with Nebuchadnezzar. There is a God in heaven that's real. I'm going to be doing the same thing with these Magian priests or these Magian uh, wise men. <clears throat> and so my thinking is, Daniel, are you in here because it's time? Yes, you are, aren't you? <laughs> uh, so I have to make a long story short. Daniel had some relationship with these Magi and these Magi during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. Told them things about the future. He tells us the same things about the future in the book of Daniel. He told Nebuchadnezzar the same things in the book of uh, Daniel. 
why would he not have told the Magians the same thing, the, the Magi the same thing? And if he told them those things and those men were sincere, they, they wrote them down. Let's put this to the test or let's, let's wait and see when this is going to happen. Daniel gave us detailed uh, prophecies as to what's going to happen in the next 500 years, next 600 years. And we can look at it now and see it in history. I think Daniel told the Magi the same thing. And if he did, and these Magi were sincere, and they passed it down from son to son to son till the time of Christ. When the time of Christ comes, they look at it and say, hey, according to our forefathers, what was told by Daniel, it's time. So let's go. And when they start this process, a star from heaven shows up, directing them to not Bethlehem, but Jerusalem. What is that star? Well, it's my opinion is it's not some extraterrestrial thing like a, a comet or a moving star. I think it's very similar to whatever it was like. It's very similar to that pillar of fire that led Israel during the wilderness wanderings. But anyway, the, the star led them from the east to Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem and not Bethlehem? Because they were going to Bethlehem. Did the star <laughs> not have a good compass or, or what? <laughs> Took them to Jerusalem first because I think God was going to awaken the Jewish rulers to the fact that what the wise men already knew, it's time. I told you back in Daniel's day, I told you in Isaiah's day, I told you in Balaam's day that a star is coming, a king is coming, and now it's time. The fulfillment of the prophecies is coming. And so when the Magi come to Jerusalem, it's not because they were confused or the star was confused. I think the star had them stop just for a moment to awaken the Jewish rulers and even Herod to say, it's time. The king is here. And then the star leads them on to to Bethlehem. Why are they following that star? I think they're following that star, not because they were astrologers or astronomers. I think they were following the star because their forefathers sat down with Daniel. I can't prove that to you in scripture. But the Magi, the tribal people of Magi, were around in Daniel's time. They were around in Balaam's time. So this information, or at least pieces of it has been passed down to us through the Bible to those pagans through their forefathers for hundreds of generations. And when these men, these Magi came to Jerusalem, it's not just because they saw a uh, astronomical event taking place up in the heavens. They did follow that star, that light, that fire. That word star means fire. And there's a whole lot of things that I actually wanted to talk to you about that uh, shows a lot of similarities between the Magi tribe, the priestly Magi tribe, and the priestly Levitical tribe. Some of the things that we find in the book of Leviticus, or the, some of the things we find about the, the Jew, Jews and their religion, and specifically some of the things that the Levites did, the Magi were doing also. Now, which one copied from the other? Did the Levites, did the did God copy from the Magi or did the Magi copy from the Hebrews? I think, obviously, the Magi copied from the Hebrews. Uh, they had an altar with a perpetual fire. They offered burnt offerings. They offered blood sacrifices, uh, just like the Jews were. And I think they, you know, they learned this from the Jews, although they don't attribute it to the Jews. They, they, they did things like the Jews uh, did, uh, mimicking some of their actions. But at any rate, the Magi uh, come in the time of Jesus to announce the birth of Jesus. Whatever it was that motivated them, uh, I, I think it was God. And I think it was evidence that God has been working among that people for thousands of years or hundreds of years, uh, millennium. And it, the fruits of it are seen in that these Magi come to Jerusalem and then to, to Bethlehem to see the one who is king of the Jews. When they came, and I know I'm out of time and all that, um, I want you to see when you open your Hallmark card, you find these old guys leading the camel. Uh, and uh, it, it's not something very spectacular, it's something rather 
uh, homey, uh, humble, and uh, we're three wise men. We've come to see the king. But these men were political figures during the Roman times as well as during Nebuchadnezzar's time. These would have been the king makers of the time. Uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's time and the time between Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and Jesus, in order for a king to be king, he has to be you know, of any respectable nation. He has to be approved or get the approval of this Magian tribe. He has to have their blessing, so to speak. And so when they come to Jerusalem, they don't come meekly sneaking around Jerusalem. They come as, uh, if they come into Jerusalem saying, where is he born king of the Jews? Herod is, is not threatened by that. Herod is, Herod is if, if we understand him correctly, he's the guy who kills anybody who's a threat to his throne. He shows that in trying to kill the, the babies. He would have killed these men. What do you mean coming in here looking for a king? I'm the king of the Jews. If you think of somebody else, I'm going to kill you. I think they were so superior a force that Herod didn't die. I think he was kind of quaking in his boots when the wise men showed up. I think this is, these are men who come in uh, on Calvary horses. Where is he born king of the Jews? And the Jews wake up uh, <laughs> and they start looking in the scriptures. Oh, yeah, well, he's supposed to be in Bethlehem. And so they go to Bethlehem. Uh, Anyway, the wise men, I think they're a lot more than what Hallmark tells us. Uh, and I think there's a, the fact that they are there on the pages of Scripture for this brief moment that they're there tells us that there's a lot more to the story uh, than what we can actually see. And if we will take the time to look at it, I think we'll see God's working and has been among those people, at least since the time of, time of Daniel, probably since the time of uh, Balaam, and maybe even since the time of Abraham. Well, Jean messed me up. I had 30 more pages of notes to go in here. <laughs> it's already past our time, so I guess we better quit. Thank you for your attention tonight. And uh, listen, I don't know if you're still there or not, but we're going to cut you off. Uh, and I will send you the link to this. Yeah, I see you in there somewhere. Uh, it's kind of dark wherever you are. <laughs> I see you smiling now. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I'll send you a link to this. I can't hear you. I, don't, I think I took this uh, headset to Russia, and I think the the King Kong in the uh, luggage department got a hold of it and broke it. But uh, uh, hopefully you can hear me. I think you said you could. So I'll send you the link to this. Hopefully when I get home, uh, but we'll, we'll get it to you. Good to be with you tonight. God bless.